to another episode of Chats from the Blog Cabin. You know, the show where I virtually invite people into the blog cabin to chat about life or to chat about books. And today we're chatting with Sonali, who is the author of The Vibrant Years. And I absolutely love this book. It is so such a diverse character. I love how it's multi-generational as well. And it's an underappreciated culture as well. So Sonali, tell us a little bit about yourself before we talk about your book. Hi, thanks so much for having me. And I absolutely love uh, Block Cabin. It's <laughs> so clever. Um, so thank you for having me. I'm Sonali Dev. And um, The Vibrant Tears is my first traditionally women's fiction book. I have um, eight romance novels out. So it is my ninth book. And um, yeah, I write stories, um, I think, that focus on female journeys and all the fun and angst that goes with it so they're usually um you know wild fun um i try to be funny <laughs> I, I maybe uh, you know succeed sometimes but i think what i'm really doing is um trying to take that emotional journey with my characters that helps me figure life out for myself so what led you down the path of writing of wanting to become a writer i have always written um, and that's really an easy question for me because I think I've always written because I've always loved hearing the sound of my own voice. And what better way than, uh, you know, to put your opinions uh, and your words on paper. So I think I was writing before I was even reading. Probably as early as I was speaking, I was telling stories. So I have always needed to hear the sound of my own, own opinions. And I think that's the heart of uh, my writing for me. So what drew you to writing this particular book? Because you said you wrote romance, but now you this one's a little bit different. Um, so like I said at the start, for me, it really is about feeling emotions because I feel like, you know, truly being alive is about that, is accessing all the parts of your heart and mind. And, um, you know, we all want to have a safe, uh, fairly, you know, stable life. But we want to feel all the things and a story, a, a novel, a film, you know, a show, that's the best, safest way to travel, right, into other people's lives, into other parts of the world and experience things. And I think that um, that's how I've always thought of it, whether I was writing romance, whether I was writing something um you know, darker, um, and whether it's something like this, that is funny. My, my focus is always on, um, on exploring experiences. And so I didn't actually think um, of, of this that much as a genre shift, as this was a different story from the stories that I had told before, which usually, um, you know, involved uh, finding yourself and then letting love into your life. That's how I thought of my romances is where you come into your own wholeness and healing and then you're the kind of, you know, then you become uh, the version of yourself that is open to love. And that's when you find, this is my belief about life, that you find what you open yourself up to and, um, and a relationship and love is, whether it is between, you know, a romantic interest, whether it is other, you know, your friends, whether it is, letting your family back into your life. It really is about coming into yourself where you're opening yourself to that experience. And so that's what my romances were. And this is just that, but from the lens of three generations of women um, and their relationships with each other. And, um, you know, and, and so I think essentially it is, that they're all three in points uh, in their life where, um, where, sticking with the old is no longer an option but change is terrifying how you know and i think that's a very universal experience and um that always goes better if you have people who you love and who love you around you supporting you and you can be completely bananas <laughs> you know and mm -hmm. and um and you can do terrifying things like go back into you know dark secrets and dark places you can do both those things uh, when you have the love of, um, you know, your friends and your family. And I think that's, that really is what this book is about, which is in some ways different from my old ones, but not, not really different at all. Why did you decide to take it through three generations? Because I love the fact that that concept of three generations of females, and you wouldn't think, you would think mother, daughter, granddaughter, but it was mother, daughter-in-law, granddaughter. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> now that uh, you know that question we could talk about all day because um because first i'll i'll address the th you know the, the three generations um it's i was I, I grew up really close to my grandmother and my mother and um m my grandmother one of my two grandmothers was a doctor a medical doctor in colonial india so not your conventional grandma um but having said that when i look at the lives of my grandmothers my mom my mother in law and me the opportunities the choices who were allowed to be the amount that has changed over just those two generations and my daughter throw my daughter in um you know across those generations the change is incredible and i think every single woman can see that in her own life right and i think that the most um ironic metaphor for that is when you look at the the modern dating scene you know here we are this is not how our mothers and grandmothers chose life partners or chose you know romantic interests um and yet here we are our choices are literally limitless and at the touch of you know a a a button and yet it hasn't gotten easier it has in so many ways gotten so much more complicated and absurd and i think that's an ironically um, it's ironic but perfect as a snapshot of how women have progressed through the ages so that really is what i was going through by putting these three women um on the modern dating scene together and uh, and seeing when we you know here we are we have the choices um here we are with all this opportunity and yet our conditioning is still very much there and so the first journey is to get over that and to understand where we are and so that's what it was you know just because the choices are there i mean having the choices is fabulous but it's a deeper journey than that to understand them um and and to use them for what we want right and so that's coming into yourself so so it really was me tracing what i believe about being a woman and how far, far women have come that's essentially you know why three generations and then i wanted to you know i think every every single time i have read or watched an older woman portrayed um in fiction it's coming from a, to me it has felt like it, it comes from a place of stereotypes so you know the body sassy older woman uh you know or then the font of wisdom and grace grandma those are not complete full people right because as you age you don't stop being you don't stop desiring you don't stop considering your body you don't stop considering pleasure you don't stop any of that and yet we stop exploring it in older characters i mean it, it it's happening much more but so i wanted to write this you know very um sexually aware sensual and yet nurturing uh you know intellectual woman who is all those things and who also wants to just live life and have fun and and so bindu was kind of the heart of all of that now coming to the mother in law question i think again um you know culture and stories and society has always told us that the mother in law daughter in law relationship is at odds with one another and um i know a lot of mothers in law and daughters in law who struggle but a lot of it is the baggage we bring to that relationship because of the stories and lies we've been told but i also know a lot of like my own life uh, my mother and her mother in law my grandmothers and their daughters in law my mother and her daughter in law and definitely my mother in law and i and my mother in law is not a bindu my mother in law is a very traditional indian woman who um who had severely different uh, drastically different choices than i do who had drastically different amounts of power and say and voice and yet in every decision and choice i have made some of which have been uh, you know very untraditional she has stood by me without question oh, wow. so here is a woman and she and her sisters in law so this i have I, my husband's from a joint family so i have you know a, a set of three <laughs> mothers in law and every one of those women has had less opportunity than i have has had less voice has struggled with different things and yet the love is so whole and so supportive 
and not once have they said we didn't have it and therefore you will not or you cannot or felt any kind of if they felt the jealousy they've dealt with it really really well they have wanted nothing but um but so the only pressure i feel is to do the best with what i have because these women are all standing on my shoulder saying you can do it do it you know and um and and there is so much beauty in that and i think that's in bindu and ali's relationship um because because women support each other you know i mean is there another piece of it yes but is there a long history of why that happens and why that's focused on i think it's a part of you know cheating us and so i i i always want to flip those narratives and say this exists too and um you know this is a beautiful thing so when you're talking about your mother-in-law have they read your book um ma uh, not yet because it you know today is when we're talking the day we're talking is november 1st and it is available for the first time in um amazon first reads today and then it will not be generally available until until december 1st so they have not read this one um my mother is currently reading it <laughs> so you can tell my nails are all chewed down um but but you know my mom um It, like all mothers can be critical but she is generally very loving about my stories which is a huge relief but yes my mother in law has not read it um but i she doesn't read a whole lot of books in english uh, she reads uh, she's a big reader but she reads in marathi but um i hope i hope i will try <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, because I think it's a it's a way it's a love letter to show that you know once you get older your life doesn't just end because yes. I think a lot of when people think when people get older your life ends you have no purpose and you're showing that as a woman when your life gets older your life doesn't have to end you you still have new opportunities ahead of you I you know I just turned fifty last month and um, you know so I am not sixty five like Bindu is. however i know a lot of 65 and 75 year old women who are way way more complete whole filled with life and desire than i am so absolutely you know that does not happen in real life if anything i think we come into our power you know if anything we come into um, knowing exactly who we are and what we want so if anything we're more alive right if anything we are using what we have learned over you know half a century to and bringing it to our life we finally have the confidence to do that and um you know that to me is it's it's not ending that is the most glorious new beginning and so definitely this is a love letter to that um i i say that this book is everything i've ever wanted to say about being a woman and as i said i started writing because i had a lot to say so i have always had a lot to say about what it is to be a woman um you know and um and how everyone around you tries to convince you that it is something different from what it actually is and i think all women know it which is why it's such a universal thing that is so true and we will need to take a brief commercial break and we'll be right back and when we come back you're going to read part of your book correct sure All right, we'll be right back. Hi, my name is Joanna, and I would like to share with you a little bit about Shores of Grace, Shores Philly. It's a ministry located in Philadelphia. The portion of Shores that I volunteer for goes into Kensington, an area greatly impacted by homelessness and addiction. And we go and we take love, food, clothing, snacks, conversation. Um, we believe that it is a way that we can meet people right where they are. and show them the love of Jesus. Uh we have seen lives changed in big ways and in small ways and we have built wonderful relationships with the people in the community. Uh we have big plans, more we'd like to do. Um and we would appreciate any support either through prayer or through donation. If you would like to donate, you can go to shoresofgrace.com and in the menu click on donate. And we just ask that you put Philly in your donation comments. Thank you. And we are back and before break you said you were going to read part of your book The Vibrant Years. So, go for it. 
All right, I figured I'll just start with chapter one, start at the very beginning. And do you have any idea how long? Just a couple pages? Just however long you feel like it, go for it. All right. Okay, here it is. This is the Vibrant Ears, chapter one, Bindu. The way a woman wears the color red tells you everything you need to know about how she feels about herself. The first time I saw Bhanu, she was wearing a red bikini. From the Journal of Oscar Set. It wasn't every day that someone left you a million dollars without so much as a warning and no way to give it back, no matter how badly you wanted to. For years, Bindu Desai had believed that life was a series of accidents waiting to happen. Fragile beads strung together on threads of varying strengths. The only way to keep them from shattering was to stand utterly still and hold them as carefully as she possibly could. Then, 26 years ago, her husband had died. Two days after Bindu's 39th birthday. And she swore to take them off and move, dance. She didn't care if the beads shattered, she was going to live. But everyone in her neighborhood in Mumbai knew her. Mrs. Bindu Desai, wife of Dr. Rajendra Desai, mother of Ashish Desai, who was studying engineering somewhere in America. Sure, her choice to keep wearing bright colors as a new widow was met with tolerant smiles. But when she'd worn her Western blouses and pants outside the house, instead of her usual salwar kameez, the women in her building had started to avoid her, especially if she dropped in on them after the husbands got home from work. Turned out, moving, dancing, wasn't quite so simple because all her friends were still wearing their fragile beads. Then her son announced that he was getting married to a woman he'd met at the University of Florida. They'd been in love for three years. Ashish had told Bindu about Alicia in confidence because his father would never be okay with his son marrying a Catholic girl, even if she was Indian, well, Indian American. Alicia's parents were from Goa, but she had grown up in America. Being from Goa herself, Bindu felt like she'd won some special interparental prize when Ashish had chosen a wife from her hometown. Too bad Rajendra would never know that she had won that marital contest. He'd also never know that because he'd died and left Bindu alone, she'd be been free to move to America and move in with Ashish and Alicia when they had Kali while still in grad school and needed help raising her. Some accidents were actually beautiful. Her daughter-in-law was one of Bindu's favorite people on earth. Sure, she was a bit, how could Bindu put it delicately? Uptight? One of those people who had always had to do the right thing. But Bindu didn't mind. She liked when people felt free to be who they were. After Ashish and Alicia had gotten divorced two years ago, after 23 years of marriage, Bindu had chosen to go on living with her daughter-in-law for one, Alicia had asked her to. For another, Bindu now moved and danced to her own tune, finally. At least as best as she could, which at 65 was not unworthy of pride. You can stop there. Yeah, I love that. I love how already, at the very beginning, you already put a little bit of mystery in there because you're wondering, she left, she's left a million dollars. How has she left a million dollars in a slave? It's woven throughout the story until you find out why, because you're getting you're giving snippets of that journal at the beginning of each chapter. Yes, I, I yeah, that that those journal entries, um, yeah, are such a heart of the book, because yeah, that that whole secret is, yeah, I think I wonder if you, you know, as you're reading it, it it's it's going to be what is going on, but I also think there's this whole story within a story which I loved writing. I do want to talk to you also about being part of Mindy. You see in the, up here, Mindy's book studio, being picked for that. That's going to be a huge honor. Uh, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, I think that, so So the Vibrant Years is um, the first. So it kicks off uh, Mindy uh, Kelling's uh, publishing imprint. So it is It is the inaugural uh, book that she chose to kick off her um her publishing imprint, which, you know, I mean, as an honor, I don't think anything gets better than that, especially because, and I um, I kind of 
really love making this distinction. I would have basically, uh, you know, been really thrilled with any celebrity picking my book. But to have someone whose work as a writer I have admired for over 20 years now, that, that there's something incredibly special about that. And to me, that's the most important piece, because especially um, I, I do think that Mindy has over, you know, not, not overnight, but literally over decades changed, um, you know, what diversity looks like in media. She has changed, um, you know, changed the scene for diverse um, creators. And um, it, it's incredible when you think about the journey and the work she's done. But specifically, I think her kind of writing speaks to me so much because I love, um, you know, I love the absurdity of life and her humor is so based in the ridiculous, right? That it, it, while it's that, it also is based in real pain and poignancy. So, so there's something about uh, how absurd life is, how absurdly we face it, that's at the heart of her humor. That was the office that is, uh, you know, Sex Life of College Girls. These are very real uh, people who have very ridiculous thoughts, but they're making these very real journeys. And so her, her specifically, her kind of writing has made me laugh and cry so much that to have her pick this book was, you know, um, was, I mean, I can't even put that in words without using cliches, but it was, you know, as hashtag goals as anything can get. Um, so, so yes, uh, it is, um, it's a huge honor. The fact that it is the first is a miracle of, you know, time, space, opportunity and hard work meeting that opportunity. Um, and so hopefully it's going to be great for both of us. Now, how did you get notified that it was good? She picked this book to be her inaugural book. Oh my gosh. Um, well, there's a story there. My, my editor, emailed me on a Thursday saying, um, I have really great news, but I can't tell you until Monday. Oh my God. <laughs> getting in there, right? <laughs> and I was like, you cannot do this to me. And she said, uh, trust me, you are going to love me when I tell you what it is. So it's worth the wait. And so that, that weekend I had to really use all my, um, you know, all my skills of centering myself, you know, controlling my brain to uh, to have its thoughts placed in certain places, not others, and not let it run all over the place. And um, I was going to go, my, my daughter's in college, and the two of us were going to go watch a Hasan Minaj, con uh, you know, con um, I'm sorry, show. And so, so it was really all very interesting that it happened in that weekend when I had this distraction from this one amazing artist and comedian, while I had absolutely no idea that this other artist had picked my book. And, um, and yeah, Monday, she was absolutely right when she told me it was, you know, I could have, I, I would have waited another week. <laughs> it was <laughs> worth it. It was worth it. Now you mentioned about the diversity. How important is it for diversity? Because like, like you said, it's very important that she brings out, she's changed the way that diversity, but being able to read authors of different colors, I mean, in different diverse cultures and learning about the cultures, because that's one of the things that I love about your book is the fact that you brought up the culture and, and how um, Bindu is a little bit different in her culture that she didn't kind of she would she embraced her culture, but she also was like, I'm not going to do the norm that's in my culture as well. How important is that to show your culture? So I, you know, it, it's a, it's very interesting that we have so many conversations about this, because when you think about it, to me, this book is not diverse, right? This is my life. Um, this is who I am. Uh, this is the journey I and, uh, and my entire family and, you know, so many people that I know have had. And this is true of Mindy and her story. She tells the world as she sees it. So what this really is a matter of is that that we are now in a place where we're trying to say that more than just one thing exists. Now, we've always known this. We've always known that there's not only, you know, white American stories. There is because America, you know, is is a, a, a diverse sleep 
populated place and so is the world now and we're all kind of because the world has gotten so small we're all we're not living in these homogenous bubbles anymore right every day we're come you know we're, we're um meeting people who who look different from us um pray differently from us you know love differently from us and and i think that as a country and as a world we've made remarkable progress in that not terrifying us, right? In thinking, oh, wow, this is actually a lovely thing. How you look, how you talk, how you uh, think uh, is exactly how I do. And yet it is so different and that's what makes it beautiful. And, um, you know, I, uh, hearts break the exact same way, right? People feel trapped in exactly the same way. It's just that the, the garb that it wears you know, the scene that I'm telling is different, but what's happening inside it is exactly what has happened to you, uh, what has happened to every other person who's going to pick up this book. So, so even to put it in a lens where, oh my gosh, this is diverse, is taking, a, you know, away from something. But if that's what we need to do to kind of remind everybody that really this is a story about all of us, then that's fine. So I'm not really, I, I absolutely want that not to be anyone's thought that um that oh you know but i want everyone no one to walk away from a book because it is not filled with people who look and talk and act and think and pray and love exactly like them right then what's the point of reading a story because we read to travel we read to you know safely strip our skin off and feel someone else's experience and so um so so you're absolutely right. It's incredibly important that we do that in, in more wide and different ways. But the more important part is that realization where we know that it's not different at all. Yeah, I think I can identify with the daughter-in-law more and how yeah. she's so scared to, to say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing or, or to speak up for herself. You know, I think that was that's me, the daughter-in-law that you know you're so scared of being rejected that you really don't speak up for yourself at least until i hit 50. once i hit 50, it was all it was like forget it and then i i think i'm leaning more towards the mother law now you know but but you're right diverse because my family looks totally different than the typical american white family because as you saw in the opening my husband's from mexico my son-in-law is japanese so you know i have a very diverse family but we're learning from each other and I think that's important as we sit down and we listen to the stories and we realize, hey, we're not, we may look differently and we may learn a different culture, but we in, inside we're all the same pretty much. Absolutely. And that's the beauty of it because, you know, I mean, love is exactly the same. Anger is exactly the same. Growth is exactly the same. And, um, and we are, like you said, all living in this world where, you know, we're, we're no longer, you know, trapped in our singular bubbles. That is so true. Now, um, what is next up for you after, of course, you have this book and you're, and the book is coming out in December, which I cannot believe you're already promoting it because whew, I can just imagine what's going on now <laughs> going through the promotion. But are you writing anything now or are you just focusing on promoting this book? Oh, gosh, no, I am definitely writing <laughs> the next book. I just sent in my revisions yesterday, actually. So the timing is good. This is my you're, you're seeing me uh, look like a human today. But if you had seen me yesterday, <laughs> I just looked like a shell of myself, um, unbathed, unslept. So so very much on to the next book, which should come along a year after this one. And this one is, uh, like I said, it's it comes out first of December generally, but it is, um, you know, in Amazon um, Prime and first reads on November 1st. So you're very, uh, today is a nerve wracking day. It is going to be, I'm going to be a wreck. Uh, this is just a front. I'm a wreck. <laughs> but yes, a very exciting times. And yes, definitely my head is very much inside the next book too. Oh, wow. So where do you get your inspiration for your books? Do you have a, do you keep a journal of what you want to write? Or does it just one day something happens and you're like, okay, I'm going to write this next book? You know, it's, it's very hard to quantify, but I've, it, these ideas come to me and then I get obsessed with them. And then I kind of, 
um, like I had this idea of three generations of women on the dating scene together for I think five years now. It was sitting in my head. I have a lot of single friends. I've been married for 26 years, but I have a lot of single friends who, um, you know, who have uh, been on quote unquote the modern dating scene uh, for decades now. And I, I mean, you know this, all of us know this, the stories are bizarre. Like that is, um, that, that is the, it takes, you know, uh, man, a giant brass heart to deal with it, I almost feel. But also hilarious and also so interesting. So all of that was sitting inside my head um, for a very long time. And then, you know, then other pieces kind of come in. There's a lot in Ali's struggles that is very personal to me she might be the most you know I, it was amazing that you said you related to her the most but she might be the closest to an autobiographical character that i have ever written because you know i was in in in, in an you know as a writer all you hear from other writers is oh my spouse has been nothing but supportive and um i'm so happy for them but when you choose to do something that is uh you know that is away from the norm that is hard to succeed in um, it, it, it's hard on a marriage in, in many, many ways. And uh, you need a very strong and resilient marriage to get through that, get past that, because it's not sunshine and rainbows every minute. You know, not not everyone has even even a really loving spouse. Um, it's hard for a really loving spouse to say, sure, you know, quit your job. Sure, follow your dreams and uh, get in the way of our financial goals. Sure, you know, open your life wide open. Uh, and um, it, it's not, it's just not true. I, I, th so, and it was certainly not. And my husband is a wonderful, wonderful man. And we have a very strong marriage even after this. But it was, it's had it struggled under the weight of this ambition of mine, right? And this love of my art. And so Ali's, I think Ali is very much, so those pieces then kind of come together. They're, they all have some piece of my heart, you know? And um, I, I'm obsessed with old cinema. And so that whole piece about, um, you know, film preservation that is part of the history of the story is very close to my heart. And so, and, and of course, you know, the growth of women, every story of mine is not about just the growth of one woman or a woman character, but just us as a whole across the world, you know, where we were, where we've come and what it's taken, because it's taken a lot of women uh, standing up for us to have the choices we have today and for us to have the lives we have today. And the agency we have today has taken all of our grandmothers and great grandmothers and mothers, all of ours, uh, to make choices slowly and steadily to let us have more than them. And um, and I think that, so those kind of pieces are always inside my head and they come together and then they marinate in my head for a good, uh, you know, I think few years before I sat, sit down to write. So it's always obscure little things like that, that kind of coalesce into a story. So you said you, this one was in your head for like five or six years. And then when did you actually sit down and start writing the book? Um, I think about two years ago. So it uh, to, to really get it all written, um, you know, and revised and polished and to have it, to have the story inside my head be the story on the page takes about a year and a half for me. That's how much once, once I started, you know, wrote down the first word, which changed about thousand times but yes and I you know it it it's about a year and a half for me usually is that like non-stop or is that like stop and then start or take a break or is that like like you said at the beginning when we were first started talking about the book and I'll today you're washed but yesterday you were unwashed <laughs> yes. not slept and you looked so I'm I'm a, a intense spurts sort of writer, so you know I am I I, I treat this like a full time job. This is what I do full time, but I treat it like a job. So yeah, sure, every day I'm doing something that's writing related, um, because promo is part of it, and you know all of that. But when I'm in the book, then I'm very intense. So for the for about the four months that I write the first draft which is a very ugly first draft and a glorified outline it's very intense then it goes away um, to my editor comes back then i'm in revision mode for a month or two and that's
but the times when that is not happening then i'm also living you know i'm traveling i'm cooking i'm you know doing a lot of reading hanging out with people the the living that feeds the writing i also do that quite intensely then so it's 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 um you know it's a graph it's up and down wow i just can't i can't even imagine what it how how do you feel after you're you have to be emotionally drained after you've written especially when you talk about you've identified so much with Allie in this book did you t treat yourself to a spa day or what did you do after you finally sent this book off to the editor and said i'm done my baby's gone it's the final revision what did you do to celebrate Ah, oh, so so usually, um, you know, I'm so exhausted. You're right. It is like having the inside of my brain scooped out. I have absolutely nothing left, right? And uh, but I'm also a mother and a wife, so usually uh, I'll finish a book if I can get you know my family and my close friends together. And like today, because I sent my revision off yesterday, I I just texted my friend this morning saying, "Can we please go have a drink today?" or something like that but uh, but usually i i just i think i always dream of sleeping for two days after it's done <laughs> i just want rest i don't want to think about it um and um you know i want to read someone else's work i want to binge something um you know i want to be fed <laughs> and massaged and yes so i don't actually you know it's just that sense of freedom i really revel in it i think that's my celebration so what's your go-to food once you get done? You said you want to be fed, your go-to <laughs> food and your go-to drink. Oh my gosh, that's a tough one because I'm such a foodie. If you've read any of my other novels, um, you know, I've read, written several chefs. I love cooking. It's one of my favorite things. So identifying one thing is really hard. Um, and usually um, I eat a lot of chocolate and snacks when I'm um, writing. So usually after I'm done writing, I need to detox a little. But if I had to go out and celebrate, like today I'm thinking, what do I want to do? I probably want to go out and eat some sushi and open a bottle, good bottle of Malbec and <laughs> drink that. Otherwise, that's always my chai is always around. So <laughs> I love that. Now, our time is almost up. Is there one little nugget that you want to share before we talk about where you can buy your book and where people can find you? One little nugget that you want to share with people. My gosh, I did. Um, you know, I, I already told you that, um, you know, which is more than I, I think ever said in public is how much Ali is um, a piece of my heart and, uh, you know, a piece of me. But um I, I think the other thing that is really interesting about this book for me is that my mother um, is an incredibly gorgeous woman. Her identity has always been, um, you know, tied to that by the world around her. It's always about, you know, how beautiful she is and how beautiful she was. But every, every person I meet is like, oh my gosh, you have no idea how gorgeous your mother was when we were in college and things like that. And, and Bindu is a person who carries that too, right? I mean, she's a and she's also a person who when i was growing up there weren't a whole lot of mothers who were very comfortable in their um you know in their identity in their beauty in their sexuality who didn't try to make themselves smaller for the world and it was i think one of the most unique things about being raised by her was that that she never demonstrated making herself smaller to me in anything and uh, and so so much of bindu is uh, you know not the trauma thank god or any of that but i think so much of bindu is an homage to her um in in just how she carries herself how comfortable she is in seeking joy in having fun in being really good at things um you know because she wants to be but in not wanting to be tied up in roles it, it just so so i think bindu is so much an homage to my mom in so many ways um and i i think that that is um a thing i feel like people should know the book is dedicated to my grandmothers but i think really um you know that strength of being comfortable in your you know in your feminineness uh and and that feminine power that uh, these characters have on the inside I completely inherited not just inherited but learned day by day when I was growing up from my mom oh wow I love that so basically it's a love letter not only to your mom 
uh, to your grandmothers. And so the women that, like you said, that have come before that have shown that we gotten to where we are because of what they've done in the past. I absolutely love that. Now, where can people find you? Um, I have a website, sonalidev.com, simple. Um, and all my social media contact is on there. I am most active if you really want to, you know, see the authentic Sonali, then Instagram is the place. Uh, my, my wild, um, you know, mom, uh, pet owner, author life is uh, very much lived out there, uh, out loud. So Instagram is where I am. I do have a reader group if you're specifically interested in um, my books and discussing them. Then uh, I have a reader group um, on Facebook called Dev Nation. And uh, you can join that. And I do a newsletter, which I sent out one, send out once a month, which is kind of fun. I call it the three R's. There's a recipe, a recommendation, and a really bad joke because my <laughs> family shares really bad jokes on the group chat. So I figured I will share the love. But when you sign up, you get, you know, a free recipe booklet. Um, and um, and it's not, I don't spam you. It's, uh, it's just kind of a fun sharing once a month, if that. So there's the newsletter. And all of that is available on sonalidev.com. And where can you get the Vibrant Years? It's coming out December 1st. Yes, December 1st, you should get it everywhere. Um, uh, everywhere books are sold. November 1st, you can get it on Amazon. For the month of November, it's available in Amazon First Reads, which is free to all Amazon Prime subscribers or Amazon Prime members. And um, you can also get the hardcover for one third its price, I think, for the month of November uh, on Amazon First Reads. And if you are a Prime member, like I said, that's already free to you. But come December 1st, it will be everywhere. And I am so excited. I absolutely love this book. And I am, I congratulations on being the inaugural one for Mindy's Book Studio as well. And I see you're a USA Today bestselling author as well. So congratulations on that. And I cannot wait to see what else you have coming down the pike. And I would love for you to come back on once this book is out to talk about how it's received, because I know it's going to be a bestseller as well, because these characters are one that I think somebody, people that read it, somebody can at least identify with at least one of these characters. Because like I said, I identified with the daughter-in-law. So there's thank somebody, you so somebody much. can identify with one of these people. So, so Nolly, thank you so much for coming on. And guys, go out and grab this book. Amazon Prime readers, you better get this one because this is an awesome book. So. Thank you so much for having me. This was such a pleasure. Thank you. So guys, we'll see you on the next chat from the blog cabin. Be blessed and have a great day. Bye.